Today on Ancestors. It was unreal that my mother found it. I could not believe that because we had been there and we had searched and, and for some reason we had overlooked that. And it's such a joy to find that. We've been in here twice and we didn't, we overlooked it. And she said no. She opened up her pedigree chart and on her pedigree chart was Charles and Polly Taylor. So this family that she belonged to freed my family. Ancestors is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the annual financial support of viewers like you, and Eastman Kodak Company. Some moments in your family history are truly unforgettable. Others are impossible to forget. Now they can all be shared with Kodak Image Magic, the easy way to make pictures from pictures. Proud to support Ancestors. with hosts Jim and Terry Willard. Libraries and archives are full of so much more than cold hard facts. They're the doorway back in time to discover your family story. So today we're going to take you on a field trip to the largest genealogical library in the world to help you break the ice. But first, meet Tom Madrid, a Colorado police officer who will show you that you don't have to be an expert to uncover the details of your family history. I come from a military family, so I really never had a sense of home. By the time I was 15 years old, I'd never lived in one place for more than three years. Okay, so if we go around here, this here is, that's not the barn, that must be part of the house. Well, let's go look at it. Let's check it out. My genealogy research, I've discovered interesting facts about local history and how my family played a part in that. The Madrids founded a, a place called the Madrid Plaza. To walk through there, to look at the map, and uh, to know that my relatives walked there uh, in 1862 was a, was a big thrill for me. We've been looking for this for a while. We read a lot about it. We've never found it. And we, have, we haven't found it. It's, it's unique that it's just right off the beaten path, right off the, right off the road. My mother and father never talked too much about their, uh, their history other than uh, where they grew up in Fountain, Colorado. My grandfather taught me things that I have now throughout my life. He taught me how to tie my shoe. So whenever I tie my shoe, I think of him. He gave me that sense of, of value for family. When he passed away, I realized I really didn't know much about him. And that spurred my interest to start uh, looking into his background. I went to the library and checked out some how-to books. How to, how to interview your relatives. I know I needed to find out where my, my relatives came from as part of my, my research. When I initially went to the uh, National Archives, and even, as uh, a matter of fact, the Denver Public Library, I didn't know what I was looking for. I knew what I wanted. I didn't know how to go about doing it. I guess it's important just to ask when you walk in. Tell them what you're doing, and tell them you don't know what you're doing. The first record that I did find was the uh, death certificate from my great-grandfather. I found that at the, uh, the local health department in Denver. And on there, they listed both his father and his mother's name and where they came from. That was the first real big record. Nobody in the family even knew that information. Eventually, my wife and I traveled to Trinidad, uh, Colorado, where my relatives had settled when they first came to Colorado. There, I looked in a variety of different uh, places for records, the county courthouse, the, the local church, and the local library. This is 1980, this is the next book. See, I, I know, I've never found it. I've, I've got the church record. When I first started getting into genealogy, I was really only interested in my, my mother's father, my grandfather, my maternal grandfather. Through that, I became interested in, in learning about all my family, the Madrids and all the families that married into them it becomes almost overwhelming. You have to pick one or two families that you're gonna work on because 
uh, you'll find a tremendous amount of names that intermarry into your families and you can start branching out all over. Obviously when you don't know what you're doing, sometimes you feel a little in in intimidated. I know I did because you have to ask that question, what do you have here and I don't know what I'm doing and, and people don't like to, to feel that way a lot of times. When I went to places like the National Archives or the Denver Public Library, their genealogy session, they're set up to help genealogists. That's why they have these departments. You can find a lot of people that are willing to help you. We've uh, done some work in Trinidad, Colorado. They now know us there. They let us go into the back rooms and look through the old archives, which is fun because a lot of times they don't know what they have. In some of the bigger cities, they're very busy. They're doing a lot of legal type things. You know, you'll find lawyers in there, you know, researching deeds. So they won't let you do that so much. I think it helps if you have more of a sense of what you're looking for when you go to a courthouse or when you go to a, 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 like the Department of Health. I know they have a form that you have to fill out to put who you're looking for, the date of birth. So if you have all that information ready when you go, if you become prepared, it makes it a lot easier. Genealogists happen to be friendly people, at least I found that. A lot of people have helped me in my research. I joined a Hispanic Genealogy Society here in Colorado. From there, I found out I had relatives. Actually, there was a relative that worked right down the road. I didn't even know I had. And she had done some work on the Madrid line. And do you know when it, when it was taken, the picture was taken? No, I don't. Because this one looks like he's a little older, don't you think? I never had many pictures of the Madrid family. She always had a picture of her great uncle, who just happened to be my great-great-grandfather. It was one of the highlights, because having a picture that old and uh, being able to see the person that I looked in the census records at, it was, it was very enjoyable. I think it's, it's really important when you start looking into your past to try to preserve it. We all take history in, in school, and sometimes local histories are, are, are passed over. When, when I remember studying uh, Colorado history, I don't remember hearing a lot about Hispanics. And uh, it gave me a sense of pride to know that they were a part of that. It's kind of uh, fun to tell people that, that uh, that I was an American probably long before they were American, even though I, I come from a Spanish background. Genealogy has a lot of different impacts on, on people. It's had a lot of different impacts on me. My parents divorced when I was 16 years old, and there was actually a period in my life where I didn't even speak to my father for about five or six years. I didn't know my paternal grandfather, Asubio Madrid. He died about a year after I was born. My grandmother, my dad's mother, died when she, and, uh, he was really young, so he didn't know his, his mother. and. Uh, She's buried somewhere in, in this local area in Trinidad, Colorado. It spurred me to find her grave. Uh, I know the cemetery. I don't know the plot. Uh, it's a unique old graveyard. It's got a little fence around it, but it's uh, falling apart. From what I understand, from what my uncle told me, that the, his grandma, his mother, my grandmother, was buried, the first one on the left here. Right so here. it would have been somewhere in this area here. Uh -huh. uh, it's not marked anymore, so you have no idea. Uh -huh. it's, we're standing on it or not. I think I can get a picture of her. I'd like to put it on a stone and, uh, and mark her grave. Uh, I think it's important for our family to, uh, to do that. There's a couple other Madrids that have uh, stones in that cemetery that I've now found were cousins, uncles, and aunts, and things like that. You know, you wonder if the cemetery back then was smaller. Yeah, that's what it is. This is it. 1935. Is that when she died? It was, wasn't it? How did it? we miss this? I don't know. You know, we came in here and we looked at every one of them. May 7th or May 2nd, 1935. It was unreal that my mother found it. I could not believe that because we had been there and we had searched and, and for some reason we had overlooked that, that certain area of the, of the cemetery. It's, it's nice, that's what I've been looking for. I, I picked little things out in genealogy that I would like to try to find, a certain person's grave, a certain document or something like that. And it's, it's a joy to find that t type of thing.
You don't oh, we've been here a lot of times. I mean, this is, we've been in here twice, and we didn't, we overlooked it. I know a lot about the Madrids now. I know a tremendous amount about the Madrids. Maybe part of uh, why we didn't know about our history is because uh, it was not good to be from an ethnic group. You try to, had to try to fit in. I think it's a little different today. I think people have a lot of, they want to know about their, their heritage, and they're very proud of it. I have since started seeing my father and uh, sharing some of this information with him. Of course, asking him a lot of questions, trying to dig out some of that. He's actually uh, offered to come back down here with me when we have some time. Uh, he'd like to come down because he left a long time ago and hasn't been back. And uh, I think that would help me in, in, uh, in just learning a little bit more about him, learning, of course, and learning a little bit more about the, the area where I come from. Come from. I've traced the Madrid line back to 1603. Before that, they came in from Spain. I'm at that point where it's almost like I was at the very beginning. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to have to go seek out some uh, genealogists, some historians that know how to do, make that link from New Mexico or Mexico back to Spain. So I'm starting all over in that respect. The Madrids will be known because I'll put, I'll put it all together in a book. That will be my legacy to leave to people. Good morning. Today we're in front of the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, Utah. Going to a library like this can be a very intimidating experience. There are over 30,000 libraries in the United States. Each one has its records and materials organized in different ways. The reason that we're here is because the Family History Library is the largest genealogical library in the world, but you may find many of its records at its 1,500 branches throughout the United States. Let's go inside, shall we? Contact all family members. Anyone that's starting out for the first time, try to get as much information as you can from other family members. The best thing to do is to start with what you know and go from there. And what you know could be what Grandma or Aunt Tilly or whoever can give you. Get that first before you start everything else. You can do that at home. You don't have to come here. Have a specific research objective in mind because I've seen people walk into the library, take one look on the floor out here and walk out in tears because it's so overwhelming. I think the intimidation comes from the fact that we have so many records and you're thinking, where do I even begin? You need to know who you're looking for, you need to know where they came from, and you need to know when and where. You know, when they were born or when they were married, some date to put us in a certain time frame. They need to do everything they can before they get here. Um, if they've contacted relatives, if they've gotten together certificates, family Bibles, old photographs, and put everything together that they possibly can before they get here, and then they're at a dead end, then come here and visit. Uh, if they do not have success, they are not adequately prepared. Wow. <laughs> One of the first things you notice when you come into a library of this size is that it's overwhelming. There are computers and microfiche readers and volumes and volumes of books. It's very important that you have a defined objective. What are you looking for when you come in here? Because you could easily be overwhelmed. What we have done today is we've brought Jim's pedigree chart, and we are looking specifically for his great-grandfather, William Henry Willard. We know a lot about him. We're missing one piece of information, and that is his birth date. And that's our specific objective for today. And it's important to have that objective. Now we have to find out where we can get that information. <laughs> Ask simple questions, ask the people next to you, um, people around you, uh, and they'll steer you in the right direction if, if you don't quite understand the answer on the reference desk. Um, but keep asking. To me, the greatest sin in coming to this library is not to ask questions. If you go out without an answer, it's your fault because you haven't asked the question. Yes, we're doing some family history research, oh. and we know, I mean, this is overwhelming to see the material here. We've more or less narrowed what we're looking for. We want to find my great-grandfather's birth date. And we know that he's from Skowhegan, Maine, and we've got a lot of information about him, and that's we'd great. like to know where, where to start. Yeah, because that's, that's what's missing. I would suggest checking the compiled records mm -hmm. for your information. Compiled records are local histories, family histories, or biographies, where individual records have been grouped and organized. What you hope for is that someone in your family has already done some of the research for you. Finding a compiled record can save you years of research time. 
get as much information as you can. You start with yourself and you work your way back. Focus on a specific family and have specific questions in mind. When did that event occur? You want to get a record that was recorded at the time or really close to the event that you want to document. When I first came, I, I didn't get very much help because I, I didn't know what I was looking for. I mean, I was just as green as some of these people that come here. They just don't know that they know that much. With, you know, if we, if we prompt them, ask them, draw information from them, you'd be surprised how much we do get. And then they've got something to start with. Having any luck yet? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's detective work. It's exactly what it is. It's, it's basically detective work. You start with the known information, you're looking for the clues that you have. I was very fortunate. The second time that I visited, uh, somebody noticed me, and he saw me leaving in frustration. I mean, the tears were shimmering in my eyes. I was about to walk out, and he went like this to me, and I looked behind me thinking he was motioning to somebody else, and there was nobody there. And I'm going, me? And he says, yes, come here. And I went over, and um, he said, I saw you here once before, and I don't want you to leave feeling the way you do, because I vowed to myself, I'd never come back. That's literally how I felt. And um, so he said, You've got, have you got a pedigree? And I said, yes, and I put it down. And he said, well, why don't we start with your German lines? He taught me what to look for, how, why, where. He showed me where the catalog was. He, he took me step by step, and consequently, I learned to do things on my own. He taught me uh, what names to look for, how the, the letters were formed in, in the Germanic script, and I was on my way. Okay, and we're looking for William, William Henry. Henry Willard. We have William Henry right there, page 311. We'll go to page 311 and make sure that is, there's William Henry right oh, there. There's Skowhegan, me. There's Skowhegan. Right. There are the children. There's my grandfather right there. Okay. So that is the William Henry. The date is August 3rd, so, so put it down three. as 3 August, AUG, 1849. But we can't assume this is correct because no. this is a compiled record. We really have to verify this with the original record. So let's go upstairs for the original record. Never assume anything. Go to the original records. That's my advice. Just because someone has done it before doesn't mean it's correct. One of the strangest and ongoing stories that we have is we get regular letters from Elvis, always on Hawaiian hotel stationery, but wanting to inform us about the births of his latest children giving us their names and weights and birth dates. And uh, so Elvis is not dead out there, you know. <laughs> he's, he's alive. Don't accept somebody else's work unless it's been well documented. But well, we have to do it one step at a time so we don't make any mistakes. It's very easy to get off on the wrong line if they're not careful. You don't want to duplicate what has already been done. There is never a name written in stone, even on a headstone. Of course, it's exciting to find information in a compiled record, but it's really important that you verify that information uh, by it looking at the original It is very important because source. I noticed that in the book, my name was not spelled correctly, and some of those dates may not have been may correct not be either. Correct. We can't assume that it's correct right. because it's there. It's important to verify everything we find. So the nice thing about being in a library of this size is that it gives us a chance to find it downstairs, and now we can go upstairs and, and check against the original record. And we're with David Barnes, who's on the staff of the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. David, we're so glad you could help us today. Uh, we are searching for the birth date of my great-grandfather. We found it downstairs in a compiled record, and we'd like to verify that. Okay, where was he born? He was born in Skowhegan, Maine. Just like most libraries, we have a library catalog. It'll tell you what records we have here in this facility. Most of us grew up with a 3x5 card catalog mm -hmm. that's in the drawers. Mm -hmm. um, most libraries today have gone to an automated catalog, mm -hmm. which is on computers or else they put it out on microfiche. Ours happens to be on computer. We can use the locality search because we know a specific place. Do you want to? So if you go ahead and turn. press enter, that'll okay. bring that up. We know the town, so press enter again. Mm -hmm. Put in Skowhegan there. Tough Indian name. And you don't need to do this, it'll just come up. No. Okay, press enter once, twice, one more time. There you go. Okay. There it is. Brief description, let's do F6. It'll bring up the topics. This shows us what records we have for Skowhegan, Maine. This shows the two entries under vital records, which is what we need to find the birth <laughs> records. If you'll press F8, it'll bring up that screen. Okay. This is the index to the births, and you needed Willard, so it's on the next page. So here is plant through Z. So we'll start with that film, 12067. Mm -hmm. And then the next item is the actual documents. Once you find them in the index, it'll give you a page number to go to. And then this has vital records from 1815 to 1891, which right. is the time, the time period that you need. Yep. 
both both the index film and the actual document film will be located in the back part of the okay, library. Okay, so this information isn't on the computer. This just tells us where to go. It helps to you the locate the microfilm copy of the okay. records. So now we have to move over, find the film, and Thank load it in there. the reader. Hopefully it'll be there. Thank you. <laughs> you never know who has the answer you want, and it may not be the reference staff. It may be the person sitting next to you. Before we knew it, I was explaining to her about a will that I had found where my own family was being freed. And she asked me who the will was by, and I told her that it was Charles and Polly Taylor. And she stopped, and she said, no. She opened up her pedigree chart, and on her pedigree chart was Charles and Polly Taylor. So when I took my pedigree chart out, all of the first names were the same. So this family that she belonged to freed my family. Here. I think it would be down here. Yeah, this one right here. And it's all and it's zero, zero six, six three. three. Here and it is. There Jim. it is right there. That's amazing. Right. It's incredible to think that this library holds two million rolls of microfilm. But you know what's important about that is that you, there's no way that we could handle the original documents so that it has to be on microfilm or yeah, microfiche. Yeah, because otherwise the original would be right. destroyed. Another right. thing to remember, too, is that the family history centers throughout the United States, many have copies of this microfilm or have access to copies of the microfilm, and that just makes more available for more people. Let's go put it in the reader. People come here to do research and nothing but nothing is going to get in the way. So they will sit at their microfilm readers or at their desks with their books all day long. Any research they do after 5 p.m. will be absolutely useless if they have not taken care of themselves during the day. Because their brain was mush. They didn't go potty and they didn't eat. <laughs> See the name Willard? Right. There's the family, and, and there's William Henry, and there's the birth, August 3rd, 1849, which is the same date we found downstairs in the compiled records. That's great. Yeah. What we have to do now is verify on our pedigree chart that indeed this was the date that we found downstairs in the compiled records, and now that we found it in the original records, August 3rd, 1849, and I recorded that. I'm also going to record on my research log the information I found out, where I found this information for future reference. But I think the most exciting thing would be for me to write to Skowhegan in the state of Maine for a certified copy of the original document because that would make it come more alive for yeah, me. Yeah, it's part of our project, project that hard copy. Because yeah. we're very fortunate to because we found the date downstairs and we were able to verify it upstairs. We had that very specific objective and we were lucky. We know that's not always the case, but have a good objective and then persevere, be patient in time, you know, the answers will come. That's good. You can hear them back on the microphone readers. I found him, I found him, you know, really loud. You just feel as excited as they do. I got some French documents and I can't speak French. <laughs> so I gotta find somebody who can translate this for me. We're here to help you do your own research. We're not here to do it for you, but we can give you guidance and suggestions of things to do that will help you find your family. You gotta kinda train yourself how to do it. Maybe difficult, time consuming, in some instances pretty costly, but it's to me it's worth every bit of it. Every bit of it. Oh, you have to be very patient as the first thing and don't give up. Don't give up. Look and look again, and in um, some way you can find this, what, what you need. <laughs> Watching people, when they finally find something, you hear a shout on the floor, or somebody comes up to the desk and they just have to tell you their story, and you sit and you listen very patiently, and they're wonderful. Don't become discouraged. Keep your antenna up and be ready to receive anything that's out there. I love what I do. I really love what I do. You're always pleased when, when somebody finds something, and generally they do when they come here. Keep in mind these two simple tips for getting the most out of your visit to a library or archive. First, start with your local library or genealogical society. The information you need may be right in your own backyard. Second, use your pedigree chart to guide your search. Your local library, historical, or genealogical society can give you more information on how to search for your family history. Thanks for being with us, and please join us for the next episode of Ancestors. To learn more about Ancestors, visit us at PBS Online at the internet address on your screen.
Ancestors is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the annual financial support of viewers like you, and Eastman Kodak Company. Some moments in your family history are truly unforgettable. Others are impossible to forget. Now they can all be shared with Kodak Image Magic, the easy way to make pictures from pictures. Proud to support Ancestors. You're watching PBS. Today on Ancestors. There is nothing, nothing worse than public humiliation. And you will do anything to try to repay, but I've seen so many other inmates that when they start being involved in family history, they're starting to be accepted again. Digital imaging. It's very easy now to take pictures that you may have of your ancestors and actually have them scanned and put onto your computer so they can be displayed and shared with others. Ancestors is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the annual financial support of viewers like you, and Eastman Kodak Company. Some moments in your family history are truly unforgettable. Others are impossible to forget. Now they can all be shared with Kodak Image Magic, the easy way to make pictures from pictures. Proud to support ancestors. with hosts Jim and Terry Willard. Today, we'll discover how computers have revolutionized genealogy and family history research. We'll be talking with a computer expert who is also a genealogist. But first, let's go to a state penitentiary where we'll visit with three men who, because of the computer, have rediscovered the meaning of the word family. Murderers, rapists, uh, bank robbers, Everyone has family. Everyone has history. Everyone really wants to know who they are and where they came from. The events that have brought me here tie back into my childhood. I lived in, in homes, various homes, foster homes, and even in my own home, and I suffered much abuse, physical and sexual. Unfortunately, that was built into my character. I have to do a minimum of 20 years before I qualify for parole. And, and the way things sit right now, I, I'll be eligible for parole in 2006. I've been here five years. I am facing a 35-year-to-life mandatory sentence in the state of Utah and a 15-year-to-life in the state of Wyoming. I am incarcerated for the crime of rape and uh, drugs and burglaries that involved 11 different states. The family history centers here are open to everyone, no matter what beliefs they may have, even if they have none. We are open to everyone. With family history, you get, you get a high every day but it's a high that you don't need to feel guilty about. It's a high that uh, lasts longer. I found that I was swept up in, into an addiction of being able to research and, and find people that was a part of me. I found one grandfather had spent time in prison in Germany, which made me feel a little better. <laughs> I'm not the only one, you know. And after reading their histories and their experiences and their trials, and that it was amazing to, that all of a sudden mine didn't seem to matter no more. That it was almost like, like you could hear them in the background say, hey, we did it, we survived, you can do it. You know, you're part of us. And you can face and do what you need to do to survive and to exceed in, 
in whatever areas of life you want to exceed in. In the discovering this information, it really gave me something tangible, that I was connected to something, to someone, that I, up to this point, I was just another statistic, another number in the system, moving from one system to another, and finally into the prison system. When an inmate and people find other people that belong to them, and all of a sudden, you're no longer a nobody. You are a somebody. And even though that you, that you may only be a somebody to a bunch of dead people, but they're still yours, and you can have them. And in their situation, they can't turn you down. <laughs> I was working with a man last week who had been, uh, in essence, exiled from his family because he had been here several times. And he had very little knowledge of his family. He had some basic information. So I sat down on a computer with him, and we pulled up the IGI, the International Genealogical Index file, which has millions upon millions of names. And I entered his name and his, who he thought would be his father. And as I entered it up, and brought all the connected information up on the screen. His grandfather's name appeared. And as the recognition came upon his face, tears welled up in his eyes. And there was some embarrassment. Here was a full grown man weeping in the presence of another man. And he said, this is stupid. I've never done this before. And I, I was moved because I saw the connection. I saw the great joy that he was having. Here was a man who had been disconnected and in a moment was reconnected. The ties that bind us to our ancestors are eternal and contain such power and force and influence when we have been disconnected, the rejoining is like lighting up a city. I had a problem with drugs. Um, I had a problem with inappropriate behavior and inappropriate fantasies uh, in, in, my, in my previous life. Um, of course, I'm still talking about the same life, but I mean previous to this experience. And it's, it's sort of like a rebirth, and I don't need drugs. I don't need the, the inappropriate fantasies. I, I don't need any of those things. I know that feeling, that, that chill that runs up your spine when you found a, a new ancestor that nobody else knew about. And, and it is just as exciting to me to see that on somebody else's face. I'm, I was really sorry to say this, but I, in prison is only the first time I've ever been happy. I've found out this inmate that I really didn't, you know, uh, know him that well. And I kind of looked at him harshly, but I found out that uh, he was my fourth cousin. And when we related this information, the friendship and the relationship between us grew to where, I mean, this inmate, he was, he was like a brother to me. I've seen hard, unmovable, intolerant, self-centered men soften. There is no, nothing worse than public humiliation. And you will do anything to try to repay or try to say, hey, look at me, you know, accept me. And I, think, and I think a lot, not only from me, but I've seen so many other inmates that when they start being involved in family history, they're starting to be accepted again. I've seen inmates come here that has been disowned by family. But then when they send out a letter, and you see these inmates will ponder on this letter for, for, for months because they're so afraid of rejection. And when they make their connection with their family and say, look what I have found out about us. This is us. 
that family often softens and re-embraces that son or that daughter and a whole new family begins. It was very hard for me to, to face my mother with this type of crime. But to do something that means so much to her and so much to my brothers and sisters and my other family members, it's almost like I can see him saying that he's not so bad. I mean, it... It's very painful all of a sudden to wake up one day and look at your past. But it's such a great, great joy to be able to do something that your family believes in, that other people believe in, and to share it with them. In every man's lineage, there is greatness. There is also sadness. There is weakness. There is the strength to overcome. And through this, I have learned that even my descendants will have an opportunity to, to know that no matter what happens to you in life, you can overcome it. I've read stories of my progenitors who have faced great and difficult challenges, some of them not very popular, not very uh, favorable, and yet they overcame them and went on to lead great and, and meaningful lives. Tells me I can do that too. Prior to me coming to prison, prior to me getting involved with family history and the things I'm trying to do to change my life, I was a very selfish person. And I would look up on other people, if you will, as opportunities to feed that selfishness. They meant nothing to me. If they meant anything, they was a tool, they was a they were there for me to take from, to satisfy my hurts, my wants, and my emotional problems, to where I had no compassion or no feelings towards other people at all, that they were just with me for my taking. Getting involved with family history and seeing that other people have feelings that are the same as mine, that have concerns with their ancestors the same as I do. It has allowed me to develop so much concern for another person. I don't care what happens to me. Keep me here 50 years to life. If you can somehow use my experience to keep someone else from doing the same thing. I mean, let me sacrifice tomorrow so you can live the next day. Who started this? No one remembers. It is merely the way grandfather did things. Ask him why he will tell you that once long ago he asked his grandfather and got the same reply. Was there ever a reason? Was it nothing more than a private opinion? Dare we cease to continue for lack of remembering or not knowing why? Maybe I'll create my own idea of tradition, just to make my descendants wonder why. The memory of tradition will surely outlive the memory of me. Actually, the word computer kind of still, I have used it and I am a little comfortable with computers, but can you kind of give me an overview of what, how you think that computers have shaped and changed the, this, you know, the hobby of genealogy? Well, I'd love to. <laughs> I, I always like to refer to computers just strictly as a tool, mm -hmm. and like any tool, be it a typewriter or something, it's just something that you use along the way to accomplish what you want. Mm -hmm. In my mind, the use of computers in genealogy is, is going through three phases. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, we used it as a method of just 
recording all of my own data onto my own personal computer mm -hmm. in a manner that I could keep track of everything and I could sort and I could retrieve what I wanted at the moment I wanted it in a method that made sense. So here we've been, we've been spending a lot of time talking about a pedigree as an organizational tool. Right. So technically all we're doing in this first phase is taking the information on our pedigree and putting it in the computer. Exactly. Uh, there's a lot of advantage to that if we suddenly find an error for instance, we had a, a wrong piece of information. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go through with an eraser and 37 pieces of paper. I mean, you just type it again in your computer and print it right back out again, and you put it right back mm -hmm. in the three-ring binder. Very convenient, uh, a very high-tech usage, if you will, but still, it's the same fundamental idea that we've been doing for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And what would be the next step? The second phase that is here now and is working very well is the collection of a lot of genealogy data onto compact discs, mm -hmm. what we call CD-ROMs. The same CD-ROM CDs that people listen to. Absolutely. They look just the same. I brought one, of course. Now, how much information is on that? This will hold uh, roughly the equivalent of 100 printed books. Wow. It weighs about a half an ounce. That's phenomenal. And it never wears out. There's no actual physical contact when it's in your computer. It's read by a little tiny laser light. This particular one I brought along has uh, census records from 1850 for the six New England states and also has four genealogy books. So if I'm doing research on the 1850 census for mm -hmm. New England states, this goes into my computer. Yes. And I type in Willard. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to see... Very quickly, depending uh, which commands you use, the default in this case will be just show me all the Willards in, on this disk. Very quickly, we'll come up and show you all of the ones that were recorded in the 1850 census. Now, if you wish, you can say, show me only the Willards who are in uh, Androscoggin County, Maine, and so it will show you only those. Multiple levels, in case, search. you know, the first case you went in and looked for all the Willards, mm -hmm. you might come up with 1,000 mm -hmm. of them. And you say, oh, no, wait, that's too many. You back up a little bit and say, show me only the Willards in this county. Mm -hmm. Does that mean now, instead of <clears throat> having all my books, now I have to go out and have all the CDs? I mean, is that? Uh, essentially, that's the way it would work today. What we're starting to see now, and there are very few of these now, we're moving into what I would call the third phase, mm -hmm. whereby you've got this information available online. This, to me, is online. the most. Online. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> <It's better>. <laughs> <laughs> online. It means it's out uh, on a network. It's on a service. It's available on somebody else's computer in a manner that you can connect your computer uh, to it. Internet is, is the, the buzzword, if you will, that, that we're all working with nowadays, and it means interconnected networks. There are many, many computer networks, and without going down into uh, detail, uh, it, it is really the capability we're talking about of dialing, having your computer dial out onto a telephone line, connecting into this network of networks. You don't have to go to a library. You don't have to go to a facility that has a CD-ROM disk. You can stay at home 10 o'clock at night. You can do it at 3 in the morning if you so desire. <laughs> you, you can't to. sleep. Yeah. Yeah you can dial out with your computer and access other databases in, in a very similar manner. To me, this is the third phase, phase of all of this, right. and I think it's the most uh, fascinating, the most interesting part of all this, because now a huge wealth of information is going to be available to you at your convenience, what I call information on demand. When you want it, it's going to be available to you. Mm -hmm. And whether it's raw uh, records such as birth, marriage, and death records from particular mm -hmm. counties, whether it's a scanned uh, book such as Savage's Dictionary, right. these types of things are becoming available now in an online environment, and I think that is going to revolutionize the way in which we do genealogy research. I've also heard of, of and, and in the past I practiced it with an older online service, but they're talking about things like forums and mm -hmm. where I can hook up, where we could actually sit down and talk with other genealogists right. over this modem right. through the... Mm -hmm. Talk today is where you can actually type on your keyboard into the network and live at this moment there are other people reading what you're typing and they'll respond and they will respond and we have uh, conversations online frequently we can get as many as 50 to 100 people simultaneously it's probably more common to have 10 to 20 wow. uh, quite often these people are in other parts of the country they may be in other parts of the world we uh, uh, the chats online that I'm involved with typically in the evening hours we don't get a lot of people in Europe but when we have our chats on Sunday afternoons we all wow. often have Europeans in there on both chats, we'll have people in Australia occasionally who may be chasing the same ancestors in uh, Europe or something that you are. Yeah. We mentioned CDs earlier mm -hmm. and the Internet. How reliable is that data that we find? Uh, typically about the same as is in a printed book. Okay. Uh, you know, you're a longtime genealogist, both of you, uh, you know that printed books occasionally have errors. Mm -hmm. We all know that. Uh, so you just have to verify with, in, with more than one source. Exactly. Just because uh, something on my screen says that Mary Smith had a child three years after she was born mm -hmm. doesn't mean that I'm going to believe it. Right. Every piece of information that appears on a computer screen 
or is in a printed book, mm -hmm. I want to go and double check that. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I really believe it. The person who originally gave that information, in fact, was correct. Right. Mm -hmm. That's still true today, the same as it was 50 mm -hmm. years ago. The computer only allows us to go through more of that information per hour. Mm -hmm. There are so many things that we hear about, so many other applications for the computer, and one that, that we're hearing a great deal about now is digital imaging. Yes. Uh, yeah. A great application for genealogy, a little bit to the sideline, mm -hmm. but something that really fits in very, very well. It's very easy now to take pictures that you may have of your ancestors, typically from the late 1800s to early 1900s, and actually have them scanned and put onto your computer so they can be displayed and shared with others. So you brought with you a picture today. How, uh, does, how does that fit in? I mean, that's a... It's well, like this, something I could play with, like oh. I could do. Yeah, this is a, it's kind of a time-consuming thing, but it's so much fun. Mm -hmm. uh, I really enjoy this. This is a... I mean, uh, these are not the same pictures. No. And okay. this it's the same one, man. It's the same man. It, is, yeah. it started out as the same picture. The one you see on your left is the original, as I scanned it into mm -hmm. a, uh, on a computer I have at home. And this was a standard mm -hmm. uh, PC and with all hardware and software that I bought down at mm -hmm. a local computer store. And again, you don't need a degree in engineering physics yeah. to be able to... Okay. Uh, absolutely not. In fact, uh, an artistic talent is probably a little bit right. more important. But if you'll notice uh, on his forehead, around the hairline, it's kind of washed out. Also around the chin, his cheekbones mm -hmm. and so on particularly came mm -hmm. out rather white. Mm -hmm. So went in with uh, just a regular uh, piece of software that's uh, available today. In fact, it came free with my scanner. Mm -hmm. Uh, I didn't even have to pay it. It uh, just enhanced that image. Mm -hmm. Right. And went in, and if you see on the right, we went in and did some darkening uh, and did a little bit of touch up with a mouse where you go in with a mouse mm -hmm. and you magnify one little piece to, mm -hmm. to just perhaps the eyebrow fills mm -hmm. the entire screen on your computer. And you go in with a mouse and at one mm -hmm. little dot at a time, you can darken it or lighten it or however you wish. Wow. Uh, and this I could turn around and share with other people. Oh, well, it's, it's on my digitally. computer now, and if uh, suddenly uh, you're on one of the online services and somebody says, I'm looking for information mm -hmm. uh, about the Reverend John Eastman of Wellesley, Massachusetts, you say, would you like a picture of him? And you can send them a picture. Where does somebody start? I mean, that's a logical <laughs> question. I mean, there are people that don't have computers. How can they go about jumping onto this and getting onto the information superhighway? <laughs> well, for those who do not have a computer, uh, I, I would very quickly say that for genealogy purpose, just realize this is a tool. Don't right. get wrapped up that this is a mystique all by itself. Mm -hmm. This is no more a mystique than a typewriter or the hammer and saw for the mm -hmm. carpenter. Mm -hmm. In most cases, uh, I would really recommend you start locally, just as close to home as you can. The internet presently has over 20 million people are using it uh, on a daily basis. I've got to believe that you have within your immediate family mm -hmm. or your acquaintances, your neighborhood and so on, there's bound to be people who are using mm -hmm. it and familiar with it. If not for genealogy purpose, they're using the internets, mm -hmm. they're using the online services, they may be participating local in Local libraries yeah. certainly certainly, are using certainly local libraries or a bookstore. Community if colleges you yeah. have courses that, well, you know. Yeah, the, the yeah. community college courses where I live are excellent. I mm -hmm. believe they are most everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah. They'll get you into computers very quickly. They mm -hmm. will get you into use of uh, the networks and mm -hmm. the online services very quickly. Then uh, at that point, there's a little bit more specialized information available on use of computers in genealogy. Mm -hmm. It may be from a book that you mentioned. Very often, a local genealogy society in your area already mm -hmm. has a computer yeah. group. Sometimes they call them mm -hmm. special interest groups. Genealogy isn't any longer a hobby of isolation. Right. One know. of my favorite stories is a fellow I know casually uh, lives on Nantucket, which is an island off the mm -hmm. coast of Massachusetts. He's a very serious genealogist, and the logistics of where he lives to get to a library is a major expense and takes at least two days and often more out of his life. Mm -hmm. He does not have the convenience. Mm -hmm. He sits at his computer, he dials a local telephone number, and he's connected to a worldwide networks, mm -hmm. and he's able to exchange information with people worldwide. As more and more of these databases come online, he can search through them to find the information. Very easily done while he sits at his living room on this island where he lives. So what's an exciting <laughs> hobby has a really exciting future. Right. Sure. Mm -hmm. If I can just summarize, then we're looking at the computer as a tool. Absolutely. Okay. We can use it to store and retrieve yes. information. And it really has an exciting possibility in terms of sharing our information. It allows us to do things that just were not practical oh. before. Right. It's amazing. Yeah. Vic, thank you very, thank very, you very, very much. much. We appreciate it. Much. a great deal. We've seen today how valuable computers can be in searching for our ancestors. Keep in mind these ideas as you begin working with computers. First, a computer is a tool to store, retrieve, and share information. Second, computers allow you to network with others who may be working on the same family lines as you are. Third, just because you find family history information online doesn't mean the information is correct. 
verify your research. Your local library, genealogical society, or community college can give you more information on computers and genealogy. You can also visit the Ancestors homepage. Thanks for being with us, and please join us for the next episode of Ancestors. To learn more about Ancestors, visit us at PBS Online at the internet address on your screen. Ancestors is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the annual financial support of viewers like you, and Eastman Kodak Company. Some moments in your family history are truly unforgettable. Others are impossible to forget. Now they can all be shared with Kodak Image Magic, the easy way to make pictures from pictures. Proud to support Ancestors. This is PBS.